all about what they've done. Okay, over to you, Rob. Cheers. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, as I say, I'm Rob Colley. I work for Janet. Um, I'm going to do a bit of a case study today about how we've implemented Drupal, um, some of the architecture behind that, and a little bit about the business challenges that we had. Um, I'm trying to focus this presentation really on um, looking at the business needs as why we chose Janet, Janet and probably at the end finish with a little bit about um, some of the things to consider when choosing Janet for CMS. So who and what is Janet? Well, Janet is a government funded organisation. Um, we provide and support the UK's National Research and Education Network, which is also called Janet, just for a bit of confusion. Um, the Janet Network essentially runs through the middle of the country and it spirals off to various institutions and organisations for UK universities, schools, colleges, HEFE, some local authorities, uh, museums in fact, and uh, just generally connects all of these institutions to the Janet Network. Uh, the network is a, currently a 100 gigabit backbone, um, and that's growing up to 400 gigabytes through our uh, Janet 6 project, uh, which we're currently rolling out. That'll make Janet one of, if not the largest network in the world um, for, for capacity and bandwidth. Um, Janet's more than just a network. It, it does, you know, it's been leading, it's been delivering network-enabled services for the last 29 years. We were previously called um, Ukerna before, before Janet. Um, so, as as you said earlier on. The Wi-Fi you're all using today, um, or let's make it clear on this, the City University Wi-Fi isn't, the, isn't Janet, but the Edgerome network that you've uh, connected to, and have success connecting to, is Janet. And basically what Edgerome is, it means that any student or any person connected to Edgerome can move between institutions and just automatically connect to their Wi-Fi. So if when I walked in the building this morning, my phone, my uh, laptop and everything, just automatically connected to Wi-Fi and I was just on and, and connected. And that's sort of one of the services that we offer, but Janet offers a wealth of other services, from DNS services and you know, resilience and things like that, and security services. So check out uh, w.ja.net for, uh, for all of that, non uh, all the other services that we offer. So <coughs> within the UK university sector and within just the general sector we operate in, there's a kind of changing time for the sector at the moment. Um, UK universities in particular have seen funding changes and challenges that they're going across students paying directly more money for their, for their, for their education. And so Janet, as a responsible organisation, you know, we're government funded, so we have to start thinking about the business needs of our clients a little bit more, our customers, all these, all these universities and research establishments. And so one thing we have to do is, and I think we haven't probably done this, in, we didn't do this in the past, but I'm going back a couple of years now, um, we weren't very good at being joined up internally. We weren't very good at understanding what data we had about our customers, how we can link all that data together, and how that feeds into sort of the business intelligence of the organisation to really give uh, and drive what the decision making of Janet's products and services are going to be and how they're going to affect, be affected over the coming years. So we started to look at all of that, and, uh, and, and the web was just one side of it, but I want to just, just to uh, talk to you about this vision that we had. Um, so, you know, like any company starting out doing a new project, we, everyone has a vision, ours was to deliver this excellent and efficient information experience for staff and customers, for coherent information and data, data architectures. Now, when people think of information architecture and they think of the web, they think about how does information flow on a website, you know, where, where should things be linked and positioned and all that kind of stuff. But for me, it's a lot more than that. It's more, it's about how does that interface with the company? How does data and systems between your internal systems and your service delivery stuff that you have going on within an organisation, how that connects to one another and how that then is presented back up to the web. And, and then again, how you consume information from the web and to drive the, that business intelligence. So some of the key principles that we had for, um, for this vision was that obviously to have an integrated web presence. Previously, this is something Janet had never had, believe it or not. You know, we were an IT company, quite cutting edge IT company that had a really poor web presence. Um, we need to make sure that we have systems that are aligned to business process. And when I talk about that, I mean, you know, if we're consuming data from the web or pushing data back, when it comes back into the business, what's the process for handling that information? How is that dealt with? And then what, what's that, what we're going to do with that information? So it's kind of front of house, and back office, and that whole complete cycle. Um, we need a capability to share information between systems. I'm sure we've all got systems in our organisations about finance systems and we've got service delivery systems or whatever that don't really talk to one another and I bet there's a lot of manual process that goes on 
um, having to share a lot of data between systems. So we need to be able to do that, not just with internally with Janet, but potentially also externally with partnering organisations and and so on. So we only also needed this kind of flexible architecture that could ad adapt and scale over time. Um, every company I've ever worked for or ever known changes their software every few years or every five years. You know, we've all heard today, you all, if you have a few people um, had old CMSs, they decide they need to rebrand, need to do it and rechange change it. So it happens internally as well with other systems. You know, you, we've got uh, a system at the moment for for, uh, for allowing us to provide set, set, uh, SSL certificates to our customers. You know, it's coming to end of life, it needs to be replaced. So we need an architecture that's kind of pluggable, that allows us to drop in new systems and migrate data to new systems and then push those new systems to a live environment without the need for the big bang approach, this whole kind of you know, uh, and a big pr um, you know, migration of, of information and systems. That's always a big challenge in type businesses. Um, as I said before, we need information that drives our actions. We want to make sure that the information we collect and everything like that drives our business processes and feeds into that product life cycle that we have around products and services at Janet. Um, easy to access and meaningful information, not just for our, our website users, but also staff. You know, they all, everyone needs to have information they can do something with and it, and it gives them that good customer experience. Um, and lastly, one of the great things about Janet, I suppose, and, and the community that we work in. It is a kind of closed community. It's this research and education sector. And there's an awful lot of knowledge and skills out there. One thing that the, the old Janet website had was a lot of content on it. There was technical content. How to you know, configure your routers and your systems in your organization. and How to set up big networks like Janet. And the community used to, you know, would use that information. It was always a valuable tool. And so, and we knew that out there, the, the type, typical types of customers we've got have a lot of this knowledge. And so we wanted to find a way where we had a focal point for our community to come and collaborate with one another and to kind of support each other um, through you know, the, the sharing of information and, and, coming, and, and collaboration. So a few of the business challenges that we had. Um, so I said before, we had this completely detached web presence. Absolutely no content strategy whatsoever. We had uh, technical content interwoven with marketing content. And it was a bit difficult to read the page, even, you know, and, and therefore, but, you know, people could find their way around, or, or, you know, weirdly enough, they did still find their way around, but um, it, was, it was a struggle. Um, so we decided, you know, we have to have some sort of content strategy going forward. Um, identity management, it hasn't really been mentioned today, but um, the web is a really bad place for identity. You know, who, you know, you can log on to a website, but you all logged on to Hotmail or something like that and used a false name or you know, to a spam email address or something like that. Um, you don't know who, we are, who you are when you're online. So identity management was really key for us. We can't be in a situation where we want to put self-service tools on the web and have somebody be able to access those self-service tools, tell us they're from a particular organisation and then suddenly change all their DNS records to point somewhere else. So that's actually a really difficult thing to, to actually manage and try and, and try and sort out. So that was a real challenge for us. Um, developer training as well. It, it is a challenge um, for us. We, when we started this project a couple of years ago, um, you know, the, in, t in the history of Janet, there was not really a web team at all. Um, I was brought in, and then it was time to recruit some development experience, and um, certainly developers around Drupal. At that point, we'd chosen the, the route in which we want to go, and actually, I knew that once we develop, uh, found these people, it was hard to find Drupal developers, but once we got the PHP developers, and, you know, we, I knew that there was going to be a difficult road to get people training for Drupal. And two years ago, when I was looking, there, isn't, there wasn't a lot of Drupal training out there in the UK. Certainly not around Oxford, where we're based, there wasn't that much there. I mean, that's certainly getting better, and um, but isn't as much as it was as I thought there would be. Um, silo systems, and I'm talking about from an internal company perspective now. We have people we used to keep customer data information in spreadsheets, some in systems, some in other finance systems. And you've kind of got this real difference of, uh, of, of storing of information. If we're going to use that in some way, how are we going to get that to the, hook to the web? So that's a challenge. Again, inefficient business processes. Janet's been around for 29 years. Have people at the organization that's been there for quite a long time. <laughs> and uh, some people are rooted in those processes. And you know, going through organizational change is quite a difficult thing to do. Um, Knowledge transfer internally was very difficult. So most of you who work in organisations today will probably have a CRM system. 
Janet never really had a CRM system up until uh, recently. And so the idea of being able to um, go out to a customer, have a conversation with them, and then go and transfer that knowledge to somebody else in the company that needed to know that, it used to happen through email and through um, just meetings and things like that. But that's, that's okay, but it doesn't, it's not really efficient. And, being, and you can't really analyze that information get any real business intelligence from it. So um, it was very ad hoc how, how long the transfer happened. However, there were pockets of business intelligence. We had service managers that really knew and understood their services and were able to, you know, they had the thing on the port, they knew what their, their customers wanted. But then we had, you know, and these tended to be people that had the information very locally to them. And then we had these monolithic kind of great big service delivery systems and databases that have been written for over the last 10 years. Um, where you know some services were ran out of that, and getting the data out of that and doing something meaningful with it was really challenging. People didn't really have that business intelligence. <clears throat> so, how do we go about solving the problem? Well, we opted to take internally, and this hasn't really got anything to do with Drupal, really, but it's important. I thought I'd share it with you. We opted for a, a service-oriented architecture, and I don't know if, if you don't know what that is. Basically, it allows us to create this kind of service layer. It, within the middle of the company that allows organ uh, different systems to, to connect into that service layer and, tr and um, talk to one another through a common messaging and, and sort of metadata. Uh, that means that m information can flow between systems irrespective of you know, what language they are written, they're written in. So whether it's a .NET system or a Java system or whatever, it communicates over common languages. And that common language is XML and SOAP, basically. Uh, and it uses things like ActiveMQ and messaging and all those type of uh, technologies. Um, so I say it ensures that data can be shared where it's needed. It forced us down the kind of route of going, well, actually, every system that we ever have in, in, inside Jack or messaging queues. Now, 10 years ago, that was quite a challenge for any company to have that type of um, uh, systems that very, very available out there. But as we move to cloud-based systems and other types of technologies, RESTful APIs, SOAP APIs, and messaging is becoming the norm. For every, you know, a, a piece of software released today that doesn't have that, it's kind of you know, not going to really succeed. Um, so what they created then was this pluggable ecosystem. It actually means that uh, system A down here could be our CRM system, and we could design, say that actually we want to have a new CRM system. It could just be dropped into this service layer. The data could be, the service layer could be used to migrate the data into the new CRM, and the old one could be switched off and the new one could just take over where the other one left off just by rerouting the messaging. It works quite well. So this is a very simple view of, how, of, of the architecture of, of, of Janet. Um, in the middle we use a, a service layer which is Fuse ESB, which is an open source, it's part of the Apache service mix, um, open source ESB. Um, for our CRM we've got a Sugar CRM, which is a community edition, another open source product that we use. Um, we've got service delivery systems that are, have been outsourced there. Uh, some of these are legacy that we've had for 10 or 15 years. Some of them are being uh, developed now, uh, but generally an app is outsourced. Uh, we've got proprietary systems like Sage that we use for our finance systems. And then for all our websites, uh, we, use, we use Drupal. So Intranet, our uh, community website, which I'll come on to, and a couple of uh, like MainJ.net website and a conferencing website that we have. And there's a couple of others, but uh, they're, they're a bit smaller. And then I talked about business intelligence earlier on and why this architecture is really good for us. And that's because we use uh, SAP Business Object, which is another proprietary system um, for reporting. And what this allows us to do, this is a sort of database reporting layer which can plug into any one of these data sources, either through our service layer or direct to the database, generally do it through our service layer, that will that they then can report on that information. So we might have data stored in one of our, in one of our websites, one of these systems and join all this information together and then business intelligence can be gathered from that and uh, help us to provide um, some analysis on how to uh, take things forward. So, why did we choose Drupal? We chose Drupal primarily because of its scalability and flexibility. Um, it's certainly scalable with its modularity and it's very modular in the way it supports, you know, but it's also flexible. We, on our main JA.net website, we can use it as, mainly as a CMS. But then we on our community website, which I'll talk a little bit about in a second, that's more of a framework. It's more of a platform. So it can adapt and it can change. And Drupal is really powerful at doing that. That's 
it's very good. Obviously, it was able to support our architecture, and not out of the box supporting our architecture, but through some community modules that were readily available, helped to make it support our architecture. As I said, it was a, it was a good match for kind of in-house developer skills. We knew we got the PHP developers, and so it was just a matter of, um, you know, already we already had a couple of PHP developers in, which was a good match for us. Um, the development velocity for Drupal was, was excellent. You know, you can kind of get, you know, relatively quickly a CMS. You can kind of quickly get a website up. So it's quite quick. Um, but as we get better at Drupal, as, we're, as our developers are getting better at writing modules or editing and, and extending modules, um, the, our ability to uh, develop is, is getting a lot, a lot quicker, and that's good. Um, everyone's spoken today about the community. It's a fantastic place. You should engage with it immediately. It's, um, it's actually coming to the events like this is, is perfect, really, for, for starting that journey if you're new to Drupal. Uh, the availability of community modules, there really is a, a module for everything. Uh, I say that. There's a module for nearly everything you want to do. And if, you, if there isn't, you can pretty much change one of those modules to do what you want it to do, or extend it slightly, or you know, do whatever. Um, I think the cost for Drupal was relatively contained. I know open source, people think it's free. It's, it's not free. We did have a cost to developers and our development team. Um, but in my experience, when I've used um, external providers, external CMS providers before, in, in other career, in other parts of my career, um, you can sometimes some of those costs can sometimes spiral out of control, and that's not always the case. But I felt with Drupal, because we're going down the open source route, we knew what our developer in-house developer costs were. That could stay relatively contained. And if we wanted to go out and get any modules written for us by an external development team or get some in at a particular day rate, we knew we knew where that was. We knew what our boundaries were, so it kind of kept it to actually contained. <clears throat> there was a. Uh, a couple of key modules, or three key modules in particular, and, and actually since then there's probably been a lot more key modules that we found out about. Um, but the three modules in particular led me, choosing, led me to choosing Drupal. Um, the first one is, uh, is Shibboleth. Um, I don't know if you, anyone will know what Shibboleth is in the room, you might do. Shibboleth is a uh, SAML based authentication system. Within the UK research and education community, there is a uh, thing called the UK Federation which basically allows you, through um, Shibboleth and SAML authentication, to log onto a website using your um, username and password that you log into with every day on your computer. And um, so through your Active Directory, basically. So it's a bit like LDAP in some ways, but a lot more secure, and it's anonymous as well. You're not asking, at this point, we're not asking for who the person is, we're asking you know, that this person at this organization is authenticated. So pretty much anyone at this organization has Anyone who's got an AD account of this organisation will have a UK federation <coughs> account and can just log on and create a, a log on to our systems. And that's something that's key for us because we support UK federation within our industry and within our, within our company. This had to be provided by our CMS, and there wasn't many CMSs out there that did it. Drupal, out of the box, uh, well, it's a community module, but plugging that community module in, it works straight away. And it's excellent. <coughs> yeah, that was a real key driver. <coughs> the other one, Oh, there's two modules here, the services module and SOAP server module. We've extended them to uh, do authentication through SOAP, which we hope to uh, release back to the community at some point. Um, but essentially, this we couldn't have made Drupal um, plug into our architecture without these two modules, without this capability. So the fact that, uh, you know, you just think about that, it's fantastic how someone in the community has gone out there, written this for us, Basically, we're able to use it. It's just phenomenal. It's you know, really, really. That's what's the beauty of the community, really. Um, so this was really important. So basically, as you can see, it's very simple. Just plug straight into our service layer, and they can then plug into any one of the back office systems. So, for instance, on our website, we might have someone uh, want to inquire about a product and they're getting something from us. So that might go down and just drop into our CRM system through the service layer, and then that fires off internal processes for our customer engagement team to go out and talk to those people and be assigned an opportunity or a lead within the CRM. We were able to take data from our sales system, so if customers need to see what financial transactions they've had with us, any invoices that they've done with us, that can be come out of our back office, you know, through us securely from our internal network right out to the web, very securely. And then uh, other service delivery systems as such can report that information back. The third one, and it's been it was mentioned uh, in the Oxfam talk, um, was uh, organic groups. Uh, much like Oxfam, we have a community website which is 
built around groups really, um, and it allows it basically allows people within our community to come together, uh, connect with one another, and then uh, collaborate uh, within a community space. And people can create their own groups, and there's private groups and 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 uh, private content and not private content, and, and you can and they can be defined on the um, by the user uh, at point of creation. So. We always knew we wanted to do this, and having something like organic groups, again, pretty much out of the box, there's a bit of customization that's been done, some extensions have been done, um, but generally speaking, it, um, it, it works. So, uh, where, where are we at then? Well, it's in this jumbled mess, uh, we have our intranet behind here, uh, which again works on OG groups, uh, much like at Oxfam, we have meetings, it, the whole intranet is, def is uh, based around groups, each department, each team gets its own group. They can create new groups in the meetings and groups area, the social groups. And, and therefore, that allows, you know, as, as I was saying earlier, it creates a kind of place where people can sort of define their own content and see where they you know, do whatever they want to do with it. Um, in the top left hand corner there, we've got our Net Workshop website. This is a, a Net Workshop is a conference that Janet does every year. Um, it's been doing it for the last. 29 years, although this is our 41st, but I'm not going to go into the reasons why it's our 41st year. <laughs> and we've only been alive for 29 years. But basically, that is um, our in-house development team um, wrote a really impressive um, events module uh, that allows us to have a very bespoke uh, events management system behind it. Um, and that is basically what uh, runs our Net Workshop website. It means that every, web, every, every event that goes on each year on year can be archived on the site. The theme changes every year, but the default theme is always the current year, but people can click the archive and go back and look at other previous uh, Net Workshops. And, and you know, from here they can do registration. And, you know, we've got all our speaker information on here. People can pay to come to our Net Workshop here when they pay there. It goes credit card payment online, fires off the transaction, pushes the invoice through our system and into our back office system in a kind of, kind of way. So um, that's one way of how our ESB works. Uh, JA.net, uh, that's our main corporate website. That's probably it's quite a developed website, but it's one we use mainly as a CMS. It's, you know, we, we very rarely have to develop this one. This is what's great about Drupal. It's, you know, we, we've been able to put a website on there. We do patches and maintenance and security releases on it, but actually it just works out of the box. Our marketing team never really ever come back to us and need to have to tweak anything. It kind of just works really well. Um, that was a great project to do. And then community. Community is really where most development of, um, that we've done at Janet has taken place. We've, basically, this is a business social platform for anyone in the UK and education and research, network, research community. Uh, um, I say just UK, it is also international as well in the sense that our partners and other NRENs around the world can also can log onto this uh, and be part of the com conversation. Um, so this is again, it works around groups mainly. Uh, there's things like question and answers in here that works very much like Stack Overflow, people can vote and, and like questions and things like that. And it creates this sort of social platform to, for that community to sort of collaborate with one another and help each other. Most recently the sort of development that we've done on here um, is in our app center where we've created a place, much like everywhere is doing apps at the moment, so, so is Janet. Um, so this app centre basically allows us a, to put a, a place where we can put all of our self-service tools that we develop um, over time, uh, they'll go into there, but also we hope that um, we, through, the, um, through things like OAuth and, and the services modules that we've got, we'll actually have an API which third parties can come along, write their own applications and put them on our app centre for our, for our community to enjoy. And our community obviously in here, they connect with each other much like on Facebook and you know, all that kind of stuff and they can start to then take that connection information and push it to those third party apps just in the way that like, Facebook and groups and things like that work. Um, so that's pretty much where we are with our websites. Um, I just want to talk about a few things to consider when choosing Drupal. Uh, many of you might have seen this picture before. Um, this is the Drupal learning curve. Um, these are WordPress and Joomla and how <coughs> difficult it is for them to learn and then this black line up here with people hanging themselves is, is Drupal. Um, it was quite a lot steeper than I expected. <laughs> um, I, think, I think everyone around the room who's ever, ever used Drupal would probably agree. Um, I think we're still learning. You know, we're, probably, we're probably just where this guy's hanging himself right now. Around there. And, uh, you know, we're on this home straight, hopefully, and I'm sure that will take us years to get to here. <laughs> so it's quite a challenge, but it has its benefits. You know, 
getting past this bit, you know, you can get up to it quite quickly. But when you when you when you get to this plateau over here, you know, you sort of the the world opens up. There's a massive amount of possibilities. The community kind of opens up, and and everything you thought wasn't possible because suddenly becomes possible. And it's, it's it's great. Um, so I said there's a module for everything. Well, the modules don't really exist for system integration. And when I say that, I mean things like if I want to connect um, Drupal um, to something like Sage or Sugar, um, there are a few out there, um, but not many, and not that do it any uh, do it very well. So they don't really exist. So they're the sort of times when you have to write custom code, or because I think that that's because there's, there's probably not a lot of people out there doing specifically the thing that you want to integrate with. So therefore, the likelihood of there being a, many, uh, you know, a lot of people in the community also with that problem is low, so that's probably why they don't exist. Um, the upgrade path to Drupal 8 is a, is a little bit unknown and a bit scary. Um, Drupal 8, as some of you might know, is, is going to be based on Symfony 2, um, which is completely different to the way Drupal is written at the moment. So how that's going to change, I don't know. Where, uh, if I was starting out right now, about to jump in with Drupal, I would perhaps wait for Drupal 8. I don't know, it's you know, something just a personal choice, but I think I might wait for that just because it's uh, this hasn't been made known yet to anybody. Um, <clears throat> there are 10 ways to do the same thing in Drupal, um, and that's not a bad thing at all, but it, we have found that, uh, you know, we do it one, we do, we, we implement something one way and then three months later, we, we need to do something else, but that means having to go back and refactor the way we did that thing just because it doesn't now work with something else and we weren't able to foresee that at the time. So sometimes that's not a good thing, but you know, it can be, it can be good. Um, you, everyone's mentioned performance today. Um, definitely consider performance and, and think about how, you'll get, how that's going to work and um, how to do that. We at Janet, um, you know, we're, we're, we're finding this a little bit challenging at times. We generally use APC, Memcache, and in places where we don't have authentication or cash. Um, but it's something that we need to investigate a lot more and do a lot more work in, certainly around load balancing perhaps and other, other types of systems. Um, I put Web 1.9 down here because Drupal is it Web 2. Um, it does Ajax and it kind of does responsive themes now, but it's not as good as it could be. Um, so I've kind of, you know, there's things it could be better. I think with Drupal 8, all these things are going to be um, certainly uh, sorted out. Um, we had to build our own, when we were looking at responsive themes um, over a year ago now, uh, there wasn't anything out there. Omega was out, they just come out. Um, and we were looking at what we could do, and we, we ended up writing our own theme, um, integrating uh, Twitter Bootstrap and Less framework at the time, because uh, that was kind of very new, um, so we, we were doing that. Um, I mentioned earlier on, in, with certainly sort of recruitment, it was hard to find Drupal developers. I think it was hard, it, you know, in hindsight, it was hard to find Drupal developers um, to engage with and want to actually, um, you know, get a, do bespoke work for us. But I think that was not the Drupal community problem. That was our problem. I think we made mistakes by not engaging with the community. I think since since we have engaged with the community a lot more, uh, all of that thing's gone away. You know, there's a wealth of people out there, and that was probably our naivety, certainly my naivety in not understanding that early on and needing to engage. So, engage, 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 you must, <laughs> it's really important. You'll, you'll, like everyone said, the help is out there, everyone's willing to help, and it's a great place to be um, once you are part of the community. So, um, some of these problems just go away after, after you know, taking that step forward. So finally, just uh, a few shout outs and thanks really. Um, some of the help that we got on this uh, on various projects that we've done, um, Agile Collective are, are here today. Um, they helped us with our community site quite a bit. Um, Mimus and Unitel in Manchester, uh, they're connected, they're, they're a hosting company that are connected to Manchester University and also in that respect connected to Janet. So um, we were, they helped us with our hosting. And again, the Drupal community, Local user groups, we've got one of my developers actively takes part in the Oxford um, local user group. Um, the, the wealth of modules that are out there in Drupal.org is a great place for information. Um, and then, sort of Aquil webinars, uh, buildamodule.com, and Lullabot videos, and the Mustard Seed Media screencast. I don't know if anyone's seen those, but they were really great help for us um, in, train, in helping support the training of the development team. 
certainly uh, buildamodule.com actually. I think we invested I mean, a few hundred dollars or something to buy a load of videos that we could just have in-house and um, showing us how to do certain techniques with, um, with, what, uh, with, with Drupal. And it was, it was a great reference tool for the developers to just keep going back to. And that's the great thing about it. I think if you go to YouTube and put in Drupal how to do such and such, you'll, you'll pretty much get a screencast or whatever showing you how to do it. So, um, again, the act is a really great reference point, uh, makes reference point for us. Um, so, okay, that's it from me. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, I think during your presentation you answered a lot of questions that I was about to ask and you, you got into them, um, they were around system integration, so mm. I guess you exposed some services from your website to your ESP? Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. So, I, I mean, in terms of that, you said you, you struggled to find these kind of system integrations, so you, you've built a lot of those. What I'm wondering is the security aspects of having your public facing website integrating into the back-end system, so what did you do to those, those yeah, basically we have um, two, well we have, uh, um, we, like I said, we've extended SOAP server and, uh, and um, the services module to do token authentication so that um, uh, only certain systems with that token could connect to, the, to those web services and, and those uh, that API. Um, we also have an, two ESBs, basically one an external ESB, one an external ESB, and they're uh, connected through uh, yeah, only one port that opens and, and they only can connect messages to one another. So we have a pretty good um, security model in place. One thing that's really good about Janet is uh, we have our own security team. Um, it's called CCERT. Um, basically, it's there to do security on the network, but we're able to use them as um, they do penetration testing for us on our website, which is really, really good. I mean, Drupal out you know, of the box is quite secure anyway, but we pretty much after every release um, run penetration tests against all our sites and all our services to ensure they're secure.